Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kathy. Welcome back to our Tuesday webinar. Uh, as Kathy said, please keep sending in suggestions for topics. We really do appreciate and look at those. Um, this week, uh, well, first of all, let me say happy election day. Today is uh, Tuesday, November 7th, and hopefully everyone is getting out to the polls to uh, to take care of that civic obligation. Um, but I don't have any voting topics today. I, I sort of thought of that very late in the game. Uh, but we do have uh, three excellent speakers from around New York State today. And uh, we have Kristen Warner, the other Kristen at Von Schenick and King. Um, and uh, Kristen is going to talk about some new property tax exemptions that have been recently added under state law. Um, that would be interest of some of to some of you. Uh, then we're going to go uh, down to White Plains and Michael Collins, a member in our labor department, will talk about some um, issues of pay equity and the problems with pay disparities. Uh, and then Albany uh, Delaney Knapp, uh, an associate in our, in our Albany office um, who, who works a lot with our not-for-profit clients, will talk about um, an amendment to the not-for-profit corporation law here in New York. So that's our agenda today. A little bit short of the full 45 minutes, if I'm anticipating correctly, but who knows what will happen, right, once we get going. Um, and with that, I'll introduce Kristen Warner here to us. Go ahead, Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here today to talk about a recent change to the real property tax law. Um, Kathy, you can go to the next slide. Um, they, the uh, the laws of 2023 that were passed in July changed the uh, the senior citizens exemption and the exemption for persons with disabilities and limited incomes in three three ways. So the first thing they did is that they redefined what's considered income for purposes of calculating these exemptions and whether people qualify for them. They also clarified which income tax year would apply when determining income eligibility because that language in the past has been kind of vague and people weren't sure which year they were supposed to be using. And they also replaced all of the gender specific language to gender neutral language throughout those statutes. So they replaced husband and wife to married couple. Okay, uh, next slide. So the big, the biggest part is the change to income changes to the income definition. So beginning with the 2024 assessment rolls, the starting point for the new income definition is going to be the federal adjusted gross income reported on that applicant's income tax return. Uh, this new definition is similar, but it's not identical to the one they use for um, the STAR program, which is the New York State School Tax Relief Program. Um, and so while the base definition is going to be the federal adjusted gross income, there are five additional adjustments to that base definition. And three of those are optional at the local level. So the you know, school district, town, uh, village can opt in or opt out to these adjustments. Uh, next slide. So the optional adjustments include um, a deduction of taxable IRA distributions. So the local option would be to not deduct those. Um, as I discussed just a second ago, the STAR definition of income includes the deduction of taxable IRA distributions. Um, that's not optional when um, calculating that um, income, but for regular senior uh, citizen exemptions and for the exemption uh, associated with persons with disabilities or limited in incomes, um, it is optional. So the second adjustment is the addition of social security benefits not included in the federal adjusted gross income. And so the local option would be to not add those in. And then the third uh, optional adjustment is the deduction of medical and prescription drug expenses not covered by insurance. So the local option would be the option to deduct those. And that's what this, the current definition includes. So the main exception is for unreimbursed medical and prescription drug expenses. In localities that have opted to allow a deduction for these, an applicant who wishes to claim the deduction would have to document the amounts paid and then the offsetting insurance coverage or the lack thereof. Um, and then the other two uh, adjustments, um, there's no local option for them, so they, but they do adjust that base definition of federal adjusted gross income. So that would be the addition of tax exempt interest and in dividends and the addition of loss limitations. So for the loss limitations, if an applicant's federal adjusted gross income was reduced by business or other losses, those losses may be limited for exemption purposes. 
though the applicant can't include more than $3,000 for any category of loss. Um, those would be like losses reported on Form 1040, Schedule C, D, E, or F, with a maximum of 15,000 in total losses. And the provision regarding um, nursing home expenses, which states that any income accruing to an owner who is absent from his or their residence while receiving health-related care as an inpatient of a residential health care facility shall be counted only to the extent that exceed, it exceeds the amounts paid by that owner, spouse, or co-owner for care in the facility, though that still remains in effect. Um, and the New York State uh, Department of Taxation and Finance is currently developing an income worksheet that's similar to the STAR worksheet for those individuals who do not file tax returns, but that one's not yet available. Um, next slide. And then with regard to the changes to um, the income tax year. So now when determining eligibility for these two exemptions, um, the senior exemption under 467 or the exemption for persons with disabilities and limited incomes under 459 of the uh, real property tax law, the applicable tax year depends now on what the local municipality's taxable status date is. So if the municipality's taxable status date is before April 15th, they would use the second latest calendar to determine whether they were eligible. But if the municipality's taxable status date is on or after April 15th, the latest calendar year should be used. So for example, for 2024 eligibility, if the TSD is before April 15th, you would look at the applicant's 2022 income. But if the TSD is on or after April 15th, the applicant's 2023 income should be used. So basically, it's allowing people to have their income. If it, if it comes before tax day, then you have to use the year before. But if it, the taxable status date is you know, after people's income tax filings are, are done, then it would be the, the most recent calendar year. Um, this new rule also clarified the rule for fiscal year filers, um, which are those that file their income tax returns based on a year that starts on a date other than January 1st. And those filers must use their latest return. So that is about it for me. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm always available to, to answer them. Thank you very much, Kristen. And um, for those of um, the public sector empl um, employers or organizations that are online, that reminded me that I should plug the fact that Kristen and I, the two Kristens, will be doing a separate webinar tomorrow uh, focused on the workplace violence um, law that applies to public sector um, and uh, tomorrow at noon. So if you, um, you know, any villages, towns, cities out there, school districts, any type of uh, public sector, I thought I'd mention that because Chris and I are gonna be spending two days together uh, on the screen. Um, with that, let me turn it to the next thing on our on today's agenda. And uh, that is the problem with pay disparity. Certainly a topic that we're hearing a lot about in the world and in the workplace. So uh, apparently there's a, a new case, right? Right, Michael? Um, and you'll tell us about that today. So thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, Kristen, there is a new case. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Collins, um, member of the Labor Department and do a lot of litigation uh, downstate. My office in White Plains uh, work primarily in New York City. Um, and the case that I'm going to talk about emanates from the Second Circuit, which is the Federal Appeals Court in Manhattan. And uh, the Equal Pay Act, uh, which is uh, one of the statutes that the case is about governs the uh, or prohibits pay disparities based on sex. And New York State also has a similar statute, uh, which is also implicated in this case. So um, to tell you about the case and the analysis and uh, give you a few impressions. Uh, a woman named Anita Eisenhower, who was a female professor at the Culinary Institute of America, claimed that she was the victim of pay discrimination under both the Federal Equal Pay Act statute and the similar New York Labor Law Section um, 194, Section 1. And as I alluded to, that statute is also designed to uh, eliminate sex-based pay disparities. The plaintiff, um, Professor Eisenhower, alleged that her employer, Culinary Institute, had violated the equal pay laws by compensating her less than a male colleague. 
the employer, the Culinary Institute's defense was that a factor, a quote, factor other than sex, end quote, was the basis um, for the pay disparity and that the factor other than sex was the Culinary Institute's sex neutral compensation plan, which also incorporated a collective bargaining agreement. And based on that, they said the pay disparity was justified. Since 2017, the plaintiff was paid a lower salary than a male um, professor named Robert Perillo, who she used as her comparator. And uh, she said they carried a similar course load and their jobs were substantially identical, and yet they were paid differently. In 2019, for example, the plaintiff Eisenhower's salary was a bit over $111,000, while the male comparator Perillo's salary was $118,000, a little roughly a $7,000 difference. So that's what led to this lawsuit and appeal was a $7,000 difference in annual pay. The pay disparity existed because um, due to salary differences upon hire, Right. So they weren't paid the exact same amount when they were hired and they were hired at different times. And then their initial salaries formulaically increased over time based on a policy that applied uniformly to everybody, males and females. When the plaintiff Eisenhower was hired as an instructor, her starting salary was 50,000 in 2002. And when the male Perillo was hired in 2008, his starting salary was 70000 but the two uh, employees had different levels of experience and different education levels, which is what the school used as the basis for awarding them higher, uh, the Perillo higher starting salary. So the plaintiff Eisenhower had been an executive chef and had 15 years of experience whereas Perillo had 23 years of experience, including previous teaching experience and a degree. And in addition, he received a higher score uh, on a cooking and lecture demonstration portion of his job interview. And based on that, um, the school said that the, uh, the claim for um, pay disparity uh, you know, was not valid. So uh, the plaintiff argued that the compensation plan used by Culinary Institute could not qualify as a factor other than sex because it created a pay disparity unconnected to differences between her job and her colleague's job. Okay. And so now uh, we're going to talk about sort of the analysis that the court did and what it found and why. Um, so let me... Just get to sorry about that. Um, so under the Equal Pay Act, uh, you can't discriminate in pay based on sex, and it provides that no employer shall discriminate. Uh, by paying wages to employees at a rate that's less than paid to an employee of the opposite sex for equal work on jobs requiring equal skill, effort, and responsibility, and that are performed under similar working conditions. So that's the general standard what a plaintiff needs to establish a claim or what lawyers call a prima facie case. But then there are four exceptions to that prohibition and um, the exceptions or affirmative defenses are if the pay disparity results from a seniority system, a merit-based system, a, a system which measures earnings based on quantity or quality of production, right? So sales, for example, if you sell twice as many components as the comparator, then you can justify a disparity. And lastly, as pertains to this case, a differential based on any factor other than sex. And so we're going to talk about what that language means. Each of those four exceptions operates as an affirmative defense. 
Um, and the last one is the focus of this case that I'm going to talk about, right? I look at it and say any factor or any other factor other than sex seems pretty clear to me. I also look at the language and think um, that Congress didn't necessarily need to put in any other factor other than sex and just any other factor or any factor other than sex would have been sufficient. But that's been the law for um, many decades. Next slide, please. As I said, this that phrase seems pretty clear, but there have been significant agreements, disagreements among multiple federal uh, courts, including other circuit courts, about the proper interpretation of the phrase. And the crux of the disagreement was whether the words any other factor um, had to be job related, right? Or could it be anything? The Second Circuit relied on the plain meaning of the statutory text and found that factor other than sex did not have to be job related. Next slide, please. They went through a very long, um, painstaking analysis of the term any other factor other than sex. And uh, they said, the analysis is so needless uncertainty and confusion on our sister circuits, but we think um, that the meaning is simple. And upon reflection, we conclude that the meaning of the phrase, any other factor other than sex is unambiguous. And they literally went through and parsed it word by word and portion by portion, as it shows here. Any means every, its meaning is expansive, other means additional, and that when read in context, any other factor refers to every additional factor beyond seniority, merit, and productivity, right? The other affirmative defenses other than sex. Next slide, please. And then they looked at what the second half of the term, right? Other than sex means, and said other than means except for, um, and so read together, any other factor other than sex means every additional factor except for sex. So as I said, I thought it was pretty straightforward, but other courts had read into it a requirement that it must be job related, um, which is important, as you'll see in a second, in terms of the analysis in this case. Next slide. Okay, so now... Um, the prima facie case and the affirmative defense. To make out a case under the Equal Pay Act, the plaintiff must demonstrate that different wages were paid, paid to employees of the opposite sex and that they performed equal work on jobs requiring equal skill, effort, and responsibility, performed under similar working conditions. If the plaintiff has established those elements, then it has met its prima facie, prima facie case and the burden shifts to the employer to show that one of the Equal Pay Act's affirmative defenses justifies the pay disparity. In the Eisenhower case that we're talking about, the court assumed that the plaintiff had established a prima facie case under the EPA. Next slide. But then the court ultimately found the Culinary Institute had shown that there was no genuine factual dispute um, which would prevent it from being awarded summary judgment on the Equal Pay Act claim because pay disparity at issue was in fact based on a factor other than sex. And it said the pay disparity resulted entirely from first, the disparate starting salaries paid to both employees and two, the formulaic application of the compensation plan, which was applied uniformly to other faculty members, both male and female. The terms of the compensation plan are sex neutral. And in addition, the Culinary Institute provided undisputed explanations for its fixed dollar pay increases. Those raises recognize the skill experience or added value associated with additional degrees or academic promotions. The Culinary Institute's justification said the court produces neither a whiff of pretext nor anything else to raise a jury's doubt or suspicion. In other words, it was crystal clear that the rationale was in fact a factor other than sex. Uh, next slide. 
Um, however, the plaintiff also had a claim under New York Labor Law, Section 194.1, um, which had been amended and was somewhat different. And we'll talk about that quickly, right? So um, New York had historically had a statute that was essentially the same as the Equal Pay Act, at least until 2016. In 2016, the New York State Legislature amended the fourth exception, the affirmative defense, right? That's the any other factor other than sex defense and changed it to a bona fide factor other than sex. So it's no longer any other factor. It has to be a bona fide factor. Later in 2019, the legislature further amended the statute to a bona fide factor other than status within one or more protected class or classes. So in other words, doing away with any potential claim or confusion as to what sex entailed. So any um, protected status was going to be covered. So you couldn't um, you know, basically say that, well, it, was, um, it wasn't sex-based, it was based on sexual orientation, for example. That wouldn't fly. Um, in the district court, right, the court below the Second Circuit that it initially found in Culinary Institute's favor and awarded summary judgment, neither party, neither the plaintiff nor the Culinary Institute identified or acknowledged that there was any difference between the Equal Pay Act and the New York State um, Labor Law Statute, 194.1. Um, but the circuit court basically said that the district court, the lower court, should have assessed the plaintiff's claim under 194.1 as all the, altogether distinct from her EPA claim in regard to the affirmative defense. So the court went on to find that whether the Culinary Institute's compensation plan Right, which is what the basis was for the finding that they had a reason other than sex for the pay disparity. Under the Equal Pay Act, whether that was job related was not significant, but under the New York State Labor Law uh, statute, which required a bona fide factor, which they essentially said means a job related factor, that that was significant. And so under the New York statute, that needed to be considered anew by the district court. And so the case was remanded um, for the lower court to make that determination. So the fact that there was a different standard in the state statute versus the federal statute caused the appeals court to send the state claim back to the lower court. My question is, and I'll be interested in following up to see what the ultimate uh, answer is to this, is if you start out with a claim or, or with a salary that the plaintiff did not claim was based on sex discrimination, right, or any um, improper factor, in other words, the starting salary was fine, and then you employ neutral factors to um, neutral objective factors for every sort of raise that are applied uniformly, is it possible that the district court could nevertheless find that that was not job related? And therefore, uh, even though there was no you know, uh, um, apparent um, sex-based difference at any time, that the pay disparity is nevertheless violative of the law. Uh, so, that may be where this is headed and we'll have to see. Um, so I guess maybe at some point later on, you know, uh, a few months down the road, maybe somebody in a subsequent webinar will be able to report on what the outcome was with regard to the district court's interpretation of the law. Uh, so that's basically a thumbnail or, or fairly quick summary of, um, you know, an interesting case. So. Uh, hopefully got something out of it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, appreciate that.
Let's uh, turn things over now to Delaney Knapp, um, who will talk about um, another statutory development. Uh, and this one is related to not-for-profit corporation law. So go right ahead, Delaney. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, Kathy, you can go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna speak about a recent amendment to the not-for-profit corporation law dealing specifically with the concept of classification of directors. Um, and so I'll give you a brief overview of what that means and then how the law has changed. So uh, typically when you incorporate or form a new not-for-profit organization, what we see is people coming in with very small, modest boards um, as they're getting started. So maybe you have anywhere between, you know, three, five, seven initial directors. Um, you're trying to figure out how you want to run and operate the organization. You're all kind of learning together. Over time, a lot of boards will make an effort to increase the number of directors um, for many reasons. One, because you're wanting to have people take on additional responsibility or the organization is growing and you just need more help, um, especially if you're dealing with volunteer boards and you don't have staff. Um, over the life cycle of an organization as it matures, a lot of nonprofits will decide to classify their boards. And what that means is create different classes of directors. So say you have nine directors on a board, um, you might create three classes. So class one would have three directors, class two would have three, and class three would have three. Um, and these classes would be staggered in their terms. So if you have a board that's not classified, every time the director's terms are up, say you have one-year terms, uh, the entire board is being reelected. And that's not really a problem until you get to a point in time where directors have been on the board um, for many years, maybe some are looking to leave. And a lot of organizations may run into the issue where you have you know, kind of a mass exodus of uh, people leaving the board because they're burnt out or they've um, maybe spent a lot of time with the organization and there hasn't been uh, effective succession planning to allow people to take over their roles. So by staggering these classes, um, you have each class being elected at different times. You can have people rotate off of the board entirely, have new classes rotate on. Um, it's a really great way to kind of enhance the continuity of responsibility, um, make sure you're maintaining institutional knowledge of the organization so that you have people on the board with experience who know the ins and outs of the organization and can really be um, important when you're succession planning on a board. Um, next slide, Kathy. So this particular change is to not-for-profit corporation law section 704. Um, previously, the way you would classify a board, um, if you are a, a non-membership organization, um, so someone who doesn't have members that have governance or voting rights, you could only classify through your certificate of incorporation. And what this meant was you either needed to be a board with foresight that this is something you would be doing in the future, um, which is difficult. You have no idea how successful an organization is going to be, how large your board is going to be. So that typically does not occur when you're initially forming. You're not going to provide for classes of boards in your initial certificate of incorporation. So that means later on in your life cycle, when you decide to make this decision, you would have to go back and do a very formal change to that certificate of incorporation um, versus how many organizations change their governance structure would be just by amending the bylaws, um, which is still a formal procedure, but doesn't need to go through the Department of State. Uh, this statute had previously only allowed membership corporations to amend these procedures through their bylaws. So if you had members with governance or voting rights, they could approve this change to classify a board through the bylaws. But if you had a self-perpetuating board, you had no members, you had to use a certificate of incorporation route. Um, basically, this law just streamlines it, allows all organizations to use um, either method, uh, and really just allows um, these changes to be made more efficiently um, at the board level. Now, this was signed by the governor on October 25th. It is effective immediately. And just for a larger context, 
These changes are part of an effort by Nonprofit New York's Government Relations Council. Um, we have several attorneys at Bond who are members on this board. Um, and there is a push um, and an advocacy effort to kind of clean up and provide some technical fixes to the not-for-profit corporation law in order to um, bring the law into, well, allow organizations to come into compliance with how they are typically acting and making sure that aligns with the law and just bringing it up to date um, and how organizations more practically operate. So um, we hope to see a few more of these technical fixes over the next year. We had some last year that I reported on um, but if you have any questions about the process of classifying the boards or how this change might impact your organization, uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks, Delaney. Um, so finishing a little early today, um, giving, giving you more time to go vote. Uh, appreciate everyone being here. Thank you for your time. Uh, here's a slide here. If you want to contact any of the speakers, um, you can do so. And um, please do send us ideas for future topics. We appreciate your input. Thank you.